So the topic that we study in my lab is collective intelligence. How is it that large groups of individuals with simple interaction rules can cooperate to create complex behavior? So what does it mean for a computer scientist and a roboticist to study collective behavior? Well, some days it means something like this. So this is me on my 45th birthday uh, trekking 10 miles a day in 90 degree weather, 100% humidity in Panama, searching for army ants. And army ants are this spectacular example of collective uh, intelligence. Millions of them work together and forage large spaces, and they even self-assemble their entire nest um, and structures out of their own body. They're nomadic, and so they constantly solve problems in their environment. And it's a really remarkable system that we still only barely understand. But you can also think of cells as having collective intelligence. So in an embryo, identical cells cooperate to create complex patterns from fruit flies to starfish to ourselves. Um, and these systems have amazing abilities to repair. Uh, you can also think of collective intelligence happening at other scales. So for example, social insects can also create uh, amazing structures. So these are termite mounds that are often anywhere from a meter to two or three meters high that are created by centimeter scale insects that are cooperating together. And this mound itself has a complex inner structure, almost like a super organism with its own body. And of course, we're all familiar with fish schools and bird flocks and the amazing ways and the mesmerizing ways in which groups of animals can create dynamic motion and dynamic structures. So these examples of collective behavior in nature, I think, are fascinating to all of us, scientists and engineers alike. Uh, and one of the reasons they're so fascinating is that when we think of an individual, the individual seems so tiny and puny uh, compared to the scale of the phenomena that they're participating in. And it seems almost mind-boggling that any individual in this system with its limited view, could really understand what's going on on the other side of the swarm. So how can the system even coordinate? And yet, the system does coordinate. It coordinates so well that we almost forget that there's individuals, and we think of the collective almost behaving as if it is a single agent. And this collective autonomy, I think, is just really striking. It's uh, something that all of us can recognize. One of the other things that I find um, really fascinating about these natural systems is the algorithms by which we believe these systems operate. So there seems to be no leaders in the system. Uh, instead, all of this complex behavior is coming from local interactions. So individuals having rules that they use to operate with others and everybody using those rules resulting in this emergent behavior. Um, and that's just a self-organization that's uh, really remarkable and intriguing and something that I think is amazing to understand. So as a biologist, the goal is to understand that intelligence. How does this collective intelligence arise? Um, but as an engineer, we're always the next question is, how do I build my own? So if we could actually understand the principles by which this intelligence arises, then could we in fact design our own artificial systems both the programs and the robotic artifacts uh, that could be based on these principles, that could achieve the same kind of self-organization. And there are lots of reasons why we might want to do so. So any application that you think of robotics, um, whether you think of agriculture, or you think of search and rescue, or you think of environmental monitoring, um, these are going to use multiple and large numbers uh, of robots. They're never going to be single robots. And if we think of a future with self-driving cars, then all of a sudden you have millions of robots on the road. So we want to be able to program these systems in a way that we get the coherence and elegance and, and good behavior of, um, of a collective and not have sort of dysfunction or have deadlock. Uh, so understanding how to program uh, collective intelligence becomes very important in these systems. For me personally, I'm also just really interested fundamentally in how this kind of self-organization arises. Um, what are the kinds of rules that result uh, in simple agents achieving complexity? Are there, for example, universal principles that you would see that would 
be, appear in cells and ants and fish and human and therefore also robots. Um, and if we could find these principles, um, what would they what would they allow us to do? So that's kind of what my lab works on. Um, we're inspired by these biological collectives, and we build robotic systems to try and emulate what we've learned from the biological systems. And we're both interested in the collective intelligence, so what are the kinds of rules that lead to this large-scale cooperation, but we're also really interested in the morphology, in the embodiment of the AI. So what is it about the physical interpretation of the biological agent and communication, how do we think about the mechanical in intelligence that is also playing a role? So this combination of collective intelligence and embodied intelligence in creating these systems. So today I'm going to tell you about a couple of projects from my group, uh, inspired by exactly the, the four examples of natural examples that I've been alluding to. Um, and the, the key theme that connects all of these uh, four examples is that in all of these cases, the collective is, trying, is creating some sort of structure. So there's some sort of self-assembly or shape that is being created by the collective. All right, so let's start with cells. So as I said, cells um, are pretty amazing. They create amazingly complex structures. This is a starfish and of course, uh, well, I guess the starfish is the of course. And the other one is a picture of a fruit fly embryo. So how is it that cells, uh, what do cells actually do? Um, so as a graduate student, I first learned about how cells organize through this beautiful article by Nuslin Volhart, uh, who won the Nobel Prize in 1995 for her discovery of uh, how the fruit fly embryo organizes itself. And what she found is that there were specifically um, special kinds of cells called pole cells, or just initiating cells at the end of the embryos that would create a chemical gradient across the embryo. And she called this chemical gradient a morphogen. And then the rest of the cells could use the strength of these morphogens to interpret the, their position in the pattern. And so suddenly this allows thousands of cells to reliably organize the stripe-like patterns that create the segmented uh, insect body. So that's sort of what you're seeing with these stripes. So what if we could create our own active material of robotic cells that did the same thing? So we have thousands of robotic cells that can self-assemble a pattern and shape. We can program them with our own identical DNA rules that encode the shape we want, maybe a starfish, maybe a fruit fly, maybe a wrench. Um, and all through purely local interactions create a kind of global structure. Now, of course, this is the stuff that science fiction movies are made of. So if you've seen Big Hero 6, you know, the millibots are essentially this idea. But it's also the futuristic goal that has uh, motivated the field of programmable matter within robotics. And our goal is to be able to create tiny robotic modules, mass manufacture them in the thousands, and then program them uh, to create versatile, to achieve versatile goals. That's sort of the idea behind programmable matter. And morphogen gradients and cells actually inspired a lot of us in the field. There were many self-assembly algorithms and programming languages that were invented based on the idea of morphogen gradients. But it was really uh, almost two decades later uh, before we were really able to test these ideas on a thousand robots. So I'll show you a video of the kilobot system, which is our thousand robot system. And here you can see the kilobots, all thousand of them. And you can see Mike Rubenstein, who led this project. He's now a faculty member at Northwestern. Um, so each robot is a very simple and minimalist agent. It can move and turn. Um, it can move straight and turn. And it communicates wirelessly with a small neighborhood of other robots. And so as the message propagates through the system, that's how the group coordinates. So one robot talks to, to its neighbors, its neighbors talks to its neighbors, and all of the coordination has to be achieved through these local interactions. All right, so using the kilobots, we can actually implement something like an artificial morphogen. And so the idea is if you look on the left, um, imagine that you have a seed robot here, and the seed robot has, sends a message to its neighbors, and then its neighbors send that message to its neighbors, and each time they propagate the message, they decrement the value. And so now we're creating an information gradient that mimics the idea of a chemical gradient. 
right? And on the right, you can see the kilobots uh, actually doing this. So we can create this system. And so if you have multiple seeds and multiple gradients, you can actually create two-dimensional coordinate systems, kind of like the fruit fly stripes. All right, so we can make artificial morphogens. Can we do artificial morphogenesis? Um, and the answer is yes. In fact, there are many ways in which we can start from pattern and create structure. And so I'll talk to you about three different ways, two from my lab and one from my colleague and friend's lab, uh, Professor Sabine Huart. All right, so the first idea is that I can grow the structure. So imagine that I start from a little seed and I build the structure out layer by layer. And so I'm using gradients to essentially create a coordinate system that grows. So that's one conceptual idea. Um, you could also imagine carving out the shape. So the second conceptual idea is that I have a sheet of cells or a tissue, I create a pattern, and then I essentially carve out or get rid of the excess material that I don't want. And so these are two ways of thinking about pattern formation. One is more like a plant growing, and the other one is like uh, examples of, ce of cell death, like for example, forming a hand and getting rid of the, the webbing between the hands. All right, and then the third method is to use multiple morphogens. So um, we can also use Turing patterns where two morphogens diffuse and react, and they create spots and stripes, kind of like a leopard coat. And those spots and stripes then initiate directed growth. So these are three sort of conceptual ideas, and the important part is that all of them come from local interactions. All right, so what is this? So here's the first example. All right, so here you can see uh, the starfish forming through growth. You can see the directed layers um, forming here. And the important thing is we're growing by siphoning off robots from this excess pile uh, of robots, and the layers are building piece by piece. And this experiment took about 13 hours, <laughs> so it's massively, of course, sped up. But eventually, we get the, the full starfish shape. And there's no global eye. There's no global coordinator. But each robot, as it enters the system, is looking for a place to fit in and grow. Um, all right, so the second example um, is the example with cell death. So here we have a sheet of kilobots, about 600 kilobots. And there's a pattern forming within it. The seed is in the middle. And then the cells, uh, the, the robotic cells, use a quorum sensing to decide when they're ready to move on to the next stage, and all of the excess material is peeled off. And what's interesting about this method is it can form really precise shapes actually very quickly, but at the expense of having all of this excess material. All right. And then, of course, the last example, um, and this is from Sabine Huert's lab, and she's giving a keynote later today. Um, here, Turing patterns are actually driving the growth. And so we're creating limb structures where the spots of the Turing pattern create the limbs. And this is an interesting method because each time you use it, you actually get a different structure. So you're no longer getting this predictable structure. But in return, you get this amazing ability for self-repair. So if you break the structure, it can actually reform a new structure uh, even without external, in external direction. All right, so um, we can make artificial morphogens, we can make artificial morphogenesis, and we can finally sort of do it on a thousand robots. But we're still pretty far from um, the complexity that cells achieve. I think what's most exciting is that through this, uh, through this system, we're able to close the gap between the virtual and the physical, and get closer to that feeling of a multicellular organism where you sort of forget that there are cells involved at all, and in fact, just see the collective entity as, as a single agent. All right, so the example that I showed you with the kilobots is in two dimensions. What if we wanted to go into three dimensions? So social insects, as I mentioned, are really the masters of the ability to construct in 3D. Termites build skyscrapers, um, huge skyscrapers out of mud, army ants construct their entire nest out of their own bodies, and both of them use a combination of embodied intelligence and collective intelligence. So today I'm going to tell you a little bit about a project uh, in my lab that is inspired by army ants. All right, so you saw a little bit of this video before of the army ants. Um, so army ants are constantly building temporary structures in the environment 
to solve problems. For example, when faced with rough and inefficient terrain, they can create these crazy bridges to overcome, overcome the environment. And not only do these bridges adjust to the tra amount of traffic, but they can also repair themselves. So if they break, they repair, they can lengthen, they can shorten in response to perturbations. And it's really quite amazing to look at this system close up. It's almost like a living, breathing, soft material out of uh, collective action, almost like an organic tissue of cells. So biologists have shown that these bridges have lots of really interesting self-organized properties. Um, and my group has also actually been able to participate in some of the discovery of the rules in this process. One of the things that they discovered is that these ant bridges are amazingly adaptive. So if you have a low amount of traffic, you have a small bridge. And if there's a large amount of traffic, the width of the bridge actually increases to accommodate the traffic. Wouldn't it be wonderful to have bridges in our cities like that, where in peak hour, they actually just got wider and then later on got smaller? And not only that, when the bridges are no longer used, they can actually just dissolve. So all of the army ants in the bridge actually just get up and leave. Um, so the structures are, are traffic, they can repair, and they are temporary. Now, we still don't know the mechanisms by which army ants do this, but there is a hypothesis that a very simple local behavior can actually produce all of these things. And so here's the idea. So imagine that you are an ant and you're walking along and everything is fine, but then somebody steps on you. And so you're experiencing congestion. And so if you're getting stepped on a lot or you get stepped on, you turn into a bridge state. And that means that you become stationary. So you just stand there and you let other individuals walk over you. And you stay that way until this, some time has passed and nobody else is walking on you. And if no one else is walking on you, then you can get up and start walking again. So it's just this very simple state machine with two states. Now, what's interesting is that the key idea here is that the system is sta self-stabilizing. So if there's a lot of congestion, then a lot of individuals become a bridge state. But actually, the existence of the bridge relieves the congestion. It makes it so that I don't have to step on anyone. And so that's what actually limits the bridge growth. And so the bridge is automatically growing to relieve the congestion. And of course, if I take away um, the traffic altogether, then the individuals will start to leave. And so disassembly comes from that second piece. So this very simple rule potentially can explain a lot of the behavior that we're seeing. The second sort of interesting thing about ant bridges, which biologists take for granted, but maybe is, is more relevant for roboticists, is that the bridges that army ants make are very amorphous and messy. Um, very unlike how we think of human bridge construction with lattices and trusses that allow us to have um, a lot of uh, precision and strength and efficiency. And so what do you get if you make these messy bridges? Well, you get two things. One thing is that the assembly is actually really fast. So army ants don't have to reason about precise arrangement or precise alignment. You can attach anywhere and very quickly create these structures. And then the second thing is that the bridge itself becomes this soft compliant material. It's almost like a polymer that has self-constructed itself. And that can fit into unstructured environments and even absorb changes. And this really makes sense uh, that such a system would evolve when the goal is to very quickly make temporary structures in this really unstructured and complex environment. So imagine that we could create uh, ants, or we could create, well, not create ants, but create a robot swarm that could do what army ants do. So if it's a difficult terrain, then the robots self-assemble a bridge or a ramp or a chain or a tower, whatever is needed to get over the terrain uh, to solve the problem in their environment. And then when the task is done, they can just disassemble and move on. And that would be an amazingly powerful robot swarm. And this is the idea and the vision that inspired the Eseton Robotica project, um, jokingly adding a species to the, to the Eseton genus. And this was led by Melinda Malley um, in my group as part of her PhD thesis. And we focused on both of the aspects that I mentioned, the embodied intelligence, how are we going to build soft, messy bridges, and the collective intelligence, what are the kinds of rules of self-assembly that would allow us to be adaptive. All right. So I'll start by showing you Melinda's hardware design of a soft climbing robot. 
Uh, it looks nothing like an ant, but it does embody the principles of uh, amorphous and soft self-assembly. So here you can see the Eseton Robotica in its uh, very native and green habitat. Uh, and it has two feet, and it's a soft body with two cables, and it moves by flipping. And what's interesting about flipping is that flipping allows you to move in many different orientations and even transition between different orientations. So you can think of the, the moving foot as searching through space for something to grab on, and whatever orientation that's in, I grab and then I can take my next step. And the soft body is really important because each time we do this, we need the body to be able to compress and, and be able to be compliant to the situation without having to reason about uh, the structure. This is still, of course, limited to 2D. It's not uh, yet steerable. Um, but at the same time, it's completely untethered and a fully autonomous soft climbing robot. And we showed this in uh, IRIS 2017. So the next question is, how should the robots attach to each other? How do they attach to the different surfaces? So here, um, we use a gripper that attaches to Velcro and foam-like foam structures um, that was designed by Melinda. And there'll be a sort of close-up shot in just a second. All right, so Melinda was really inspired by the idea of uh, tarsal hooks that can grab into textured surfaces. So our robots have grippers and they have stretchable skins. And so the gripper works with these corkscrews that can wind into surfaces like foam or uh, surfaces like Velcro and unwind to let go. And so now the important thing is that the robot can actually climb over another robot and it can attach anywhere along the body of the robot. So there's no longer any need for precise alignment or um, any kind of negotiation between the, the robots at all. And we're still working on making this climbing more uh, reliable. As you'll see, it's not always quite as reliable as we hope. Um, but again, we can have uh, multiple structures and the um, gripper itself is really strong. And so we can imagine creating cantilevers or chains in the future. All right, so the next step is the collective intelligence. So if ants can detect that they're walking over each other, we need the robots to detect that they can walk over each other. And we use vibration in order to detect that. So here you can see two robots that are fully autonomous um, that are basically running now the full, the full two-state algorithm. So the top robot uh, is climbing, and eventually it'll climb over the bottom robot. All right. And when it does so, the bottom robot senses that it's being walked over and decides to become stationary and become a temporary bridge. And this allows the top robot now to climb over um, and continue its journey. And then the bridge robot, a little bit too quickly, decides to leave, and, and then it actually escapes <laughs> our confines. Um, but these are our, our, our first experiments with, uh, with two robots. All right. So um, that's two robots. What happens when we have hundreds of robots running those particular rules? So here you can see an abstract simulation. We're simulating sort of the flipping robot um, as a rigid flipping robot that makes compliant joints. And we actually can reproduce. We can see that the system reproduces the behaviors that I mentioned before. If the traffic is low, you make tiny bridges. If the traffic is really high, you start to make larger bridges, and the bridges are self-stabilizing. Um, and here you can see sort of the dynamics of bridge connection and also some trapped robots. And then if we stop the traffic, then in fact, the bridge starts to disassemble and eventually all of the robots are able to continue along their journey. And so it's sort of interesting that this very simple behavior with a few modifications uh, is really able to create the kind of behavior that the biologist expected. I'll say. What's also interesting is that this was sort of mimicking the V-bridges that Simone Garnier's group uh, studied, but actually it can make other kinds of structures as well. So you can make ramps, for example, um, that help you climb up or ramps that help you climb down. And at all times, these structures are essentially increasing the efficiency of the movement by relieving the congestion in the system. 
So here again, you can see um, the assembly and disassembly. Um, and recently, Melinda Malley, who's now at uh, Olin College, is a faculty at Olin College, um, her and her students showed that with some goal-directed behavior, we can actually also create these more complex structures that we see with um, army ants and weaver ants, where you create cantilevers and other structures to help you get across gaps. So here, eventually, we'll have a robot that manages to get across. All right. So these very simple kind of rule actually has an immense amount of flexibility. All right, so I've shown you uh, a, a soft robot inspired by army ants um, and how we can use both the embodied intelligence and uh, really interesting ways of tactile communication for these robots to coordinate. But of course, this is only one example of a mechanical design. I think social insects are constantly inspiring us to create robots that have more physical capabilities than we assume a, a simple robot would have. And eventually, maybe we can do in the environment the kind of things that ants uh, and termites and bees are able to do. All right, so of course, Robots that climb over each other is still uh, a lot of is still more like science fiction, but climbing robots have many different applications uh, in general. So if we can make really good climbing robots, we could imagine creating uh, robots that can inspect more complex structures. And so we have a joint project right now. This is fairly new uh, with Dr. Errol Ekbla, who's the director of the MIT Media uh, Media Lab Space Exploration Initiative to look at heterogeneous swarms composed of both rigid and soft climbing robots that might be able to cooperate to move over complex structures. And we had a great experience of being able to test some of our robots and some of their robots uh, on the zero-g zero flights uh, during the pandemic. And we're continuing this work now uh, at Princeton, where I am. This is uh, Dr. Bahar Hagea. She's now a faculty member at University of Kroningen and has been leading this project as well to think about inspection swarms in general with climbing robots. So I think there's just a lot of ways in which ants can continue to inspire us. To me, this just reminds me of arboreal ants that live in trees. <laughs> All right, so the last example of collective intelligence that I want to show you is an example of a collective that does more than just create structure. It actually creates structure in motion. And that's fish schools. Um, so fish schools create incredible dynamic structures. They collectively migrate long distances, even through cluttered environments like coral reefs. And they align uh, in these beautiful ways um, to keep together uh, the whole time. And they create even more complex formation like bait balls and fountain maneuvers to evade predators. Uh, and it's really, of course, always really beautiful to watch. All right. So recently, we've made a tremendous amount of progress in our ability to make aerial swarms. Um, but doing underwater swarms has been uh, a lot more challenging. One reason is that above ground, we can use GPS for global positioning, and we can use explicit wireless communication to coordinate. But underwater, these systems are not available, and so suddenly it's much more difficult uh, to, to recreate that, um, that progress underwater. Um, the field has been pursuing many different approaches. So for example, you could have robots that uh, only communicate at the surface and don't communicate underwater. Um, Many groups are looking at using acoustic technologies to recreate localization and communication underwater. And there's also work on using heterogeneous swarms that combine all of these many options so that there's many modes of communication available to the swarm. But when we look at large fish schools, large fish schools actually primarily rely on what's called as implicit coordination. So instead of explicitly talking with your neighbors, you observe your neighbors and you react to your local neighborhood. And as I react to you and you react to someone else and someone else reacts to someone else, the whole system has this wave of reactions and observations going through. And that's, um, and that's how the coordination is happening. And there's a lot of biological studies and theoretical studies showing that implicit coordination can be really powerful and create really complex behavior. So if we want to mimic this achievement, uh, then we need to recreate both the collective intelligence and the embodied intelligence. 
So we need to understand what these rules are that would allow us to create this complex formation. Um, but we also need to be able to build the ability to um, observe your local neighborhood in 3D, so 3D perception, and react to your local neighborhood or to have 3D maneuverability. So this is the, the inspiration behind the Blue Swarm project in my group, which is a relatively new project in my group. Um, and the Blue Swarm has been, is led by uh, Florian Berlinger, who's, who just completed his PhD thesis and is also giving a talk uh, today in a later session. Um, so the Blue Swarm uh, project, the goal is to create a swarm of fully autonomous miniature underwater robots that are capable of three-dimensional implicit coordination. And to use it as a test bed, really, for studying the power and limitations of implicit coordinations. What is it that we can and cannot do uh, if we're not allowed to exchange explicit messages? So this is what the, the robot looks like. It's about 13 centimeters in length. Uh, and 3D motion is achieved with multiple fins that use a simple magnet and coil actuator. And these actuators are really small and can be submerged in water. And then 3D perception is, is achieved with two wide angle cameras that give us an almost complete 360 view. And we use these blue LEDs to detect the position, distance, and headings of neighbor robots, so usually using three LEDs. Um, from a blue bot's point of view, though, in a crowd, what you see is a whole bunch of dots. <laughs> um, and somehow, we have to turn this notion of visual perception of dots into a notion of neighborhood. How many neighbors do you have? Where are they? And what are they doing? Um, and of course, there are errors from occlusion, ambiguity, reflections. Um, but it turns out that just with this uh, simple but three-dimensional perception, of our neighborhood, we can start to experiment with many different forms of self-organization underwater. And so we've been looking at many of the classic examples of self-organization um, that people have studied theoretically, implementing them in the blue swarm. All right, so what's an example of something that you can do with implicit coordination? Um, so the most classic example, of course, is flocking or, or schooling. Um, and in the 1980s, the late 1980s, there was a very famous paper, which maybe many of you know, called Boyd's, uh, written by Craig Reynolds, where he described the behavior of bird flocks and fish schools with a simple combination of three local neighborhood rules. So the idea is that I look at my neighborhood and I try to align with my neighbors, and I am a little bit repulsed by my neighbors because I don't want to collide with them, but I also want to be close to them. So I have alignment, repulsion, and cohesion. And this was inspired by decades of studies on fish schools. And he demonstrated uh, animations where these bird flocks would move through complex environments uh, and exhibit all of the properties that we think of uh, with flocks. And these flocking rules have been uh, studied a tremendous amount since then. But fish do a lot more than just flock. Um, they actually build, make really complex uh, formations, complex dynamic formations. For example, circular mills, or as you can see here, a fountain maneuver when they're evading predators. So I'll tell you about two other dynamic formations that can be achieved through implicit coordination and show you a little bit of um, what they look like in the blue swarm. All right, so the first one is milling. So you could think of milling as essentially flocking in a circle. Um, and there are several groups that have shown um, from a theoretical point of view that milling can be thought of as a special state in flocking. So if you pick just the right parameters for alignment, repulsion, and cohesion, then in fact the group will start uh, creating these dynamic structures. Um, but this assumes that each robot can sense all of its neighbor's positions and headings. Um, in, in some recent work, uh, in 2014, um, Roderick Gross's group uh, in Sheffield showed that, in fact, you could achieve a milling-like behavior with a much simpler and minimalist uh, algorithm. And in this algorithm, a robot, all it does is it looks for the absence or presence of robots in front of it. So if there's a robot in front of it, it takes a kind of evasive action to the left. If it's not, then it starts to slowly move to the right. And what's really interesting about this system is that when you program up robots to do this, 
In fact, the only stable state in this system is for them to end up in a circle and equally spaced in the circle. So no individual robot is really trying to be in a circle. The size of the circle is actually not encoded in the program at all, but the entire behavior emerges from these very simple rules. Um, and this is really great because it asks very little of the robots in general and produces this, this beautiful milling behavior. So this is what it looks like in the blue swarm with our seven, uh, our seven robots. And you can see the robots start to uh, form a circle. Um, and every so often they hit the walls of the tank, which perturbs the circle, but the circle actually continuously repairs. And you'll see in a moment that the circle can also adjust even if we add and remove individuals um, from this from the setting. So here you can see a little bit more of the perturbation. Here you can see it from the side view. So we actually have a cylinder of robots moving together. So we can do this both in 2D and also in 3D. Um, and this is just showing the trajectories. So with the blue swarm, we actually try to log all of the behavior so we can compare um, the physical system to the theoretical system and understand what are the differences that we see when we try to implement these systems. So here you can again see the group um, making a small circle, and then Florian adds some robots. Um, I know it really looks like he has a bucket full of <laughs> dead fish or a live fish. Um, and each time we have different numbers of robots, the size of the, the circle adjusts. So it's really interesting that this complex behavior can come from these really simple uh, rules. All right, another behavior that we looked at, which is a dynamic behavior, is called the fountain maneuver. And it's sort of the video that you saw before. And the idea is that you have a group of robots or a group of fish that are, um, that are aligned and moving along, and a predator comes along. But when the predator gets too close, the group sort of becomes this fountain where they go in all directions. And this creates sensory confusion that makes it difficult for the predator to catch a fish. And then they reassemble behind the predator um, and are, are always trying to be behind the predator. So this seems like a really complex formation, but Actually, um, it was proposed that this formation comes also from a very simple potential behavior from fish. And the idea is that when the predator is close, a fish attempts to escape the predator by, by angling the predator to be behind it. So if you imagine that I have a blind spot behind me, I'm trying to keep my predator almost at the edge of my blind spot behind me. So if you look at this image over here, what's happening is depending on where I am relative to the predator, I actually will try to make my heading so that it creates a fountain-like structure. So in fact, all of the individual uh, fish, when they react to the predator, create individually this beautiful display. So you have escape plus alignment. And when we program up robots to, to follow these rules, this is again um, a simulation of what it looks like. So here's the predator, the individual robots then try to keep it at the back of their route, and then they re-emerge and uh, align behind the predator. All right. And here's what it looks like uh, with Bluebots. These experiments were actually all conducted during the pandemic. So I have to say that both Paula Wilkop and Florian who did this, it was an amazing uh, labor of love. Um, but the predator can move through the group, and we actually have uh, the robots able to create these structures. And so the first thing that we need to do is align. Um, and so here you can see uh, some studies on the alignment. So this is a top view from the side. You can see the three LEDs, and the robots are trying to align with each other, um, but in a stationary form. And then the second piece is escape. So we bring a predator through the group. You see a predator in a second. The predator is essentially a, a red fish, but really it's a, it's a red stick <laughs> being moved by, by Florian or Paula. You can see the individual sort of try to keep that stick at, towards its back. So here it is from the top view. And, and we were able to do a couple of experiments in a much larger tank as well. It's a little bit harder to see. All right. 
Um, so we're beginning to be able to program these kinds of dynamic structures. Of course, the swarm is still really small, so we have a lot to do to be able to get, maybe not to a thousand robots, but it would be nice to be able to get to a fish school uh, or a bluebot school of a hundred. Um, and of course, we have a lot more to do to get out uh, into the wild. Uh, these are the robots actually taking an outing at uh, Walden Pond. But I think through these systems and through these test beds, we are starting to uncover the power and ability to program systems purely through implicit collect, uh, through implicit coordination. And eventually in GPS denied environments uh, or com communication denied environments, these are the kinds of algorithms that we can use. All right, how am I doing? All right, so what can thousands of individuals do as a, a collective? So I wanna um, end my talk by pointing out that, uh, of course, science <laughs> is maybe one of the most important things uh, at least humans are doing as a, as a collective intelligence. And so all of the work that I presented today is itself the product of collective intelligence. Um, I have this great group of people with whom I get to work. Uh, scientists, engineers, mathematicians, and truly working together, we are, uh, we have been able to transcend what we bring to the table and become uh, more than the sum of our parts. I also wanted to say that it's really exciting for me to, to be here uh, in Japan. In fact, my robotics journey started, my first robotics conference was here uh, when IRUS was here in 2004 in Sendai. Uh, and I came here with my friend and colleague, Casper Stoy. And at the time I had zero robots um, and I had zero ambition <laughs> to have robots. So it was really exciting to come back in 2022 with thousands of robots in the lab and many more thousands of robots commercially uh, in other people's labs and in, in people's homes. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm really honored uh, and excited to be back here. It's been quite a journey. Um, and I wanted to end by um, <clears throat> making a special thanks to a very special collective whose activism, courage, hard work, and very deep friendships uh, really made this journey for me possible. And sorry, this is obviously very emotional for me. And I especially want to thank uh, three senior women um, who've made an enormous difference to my career. All three of them are pioneers in their own research area. And even as they face so many odds as women themselves, they always took out the time to fight barriers and open doors uh, for women like me. <laughs> Never once asking me for thanks. So I wanna use this opportunity to say thanks and to thanks to all of the women here in IROS. You make this journey very fun for me and you make me wanna stay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Radhika, for that inspiring talk with uh, amazing visuals. Yeah. And I'm just now imagining all the things that I want swarms of robots to do for me. Um, we have time for questions. If you have a question, please come down to one of the microphones and, uh, and we'll hear from you. We'll start over here. Hello. Good morning. Thank you very much. Hello here. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you got it. I'm Toshi Fukuda. Uh, I'm very, very uh, enthusiastic about your work because I like those kind of uh, swarm robotics, collector robotics, such a thing. Uh, particularly, I have a kind of uh, two questions because you are so fantastic research of a killer robot or everything. Uh, first of all, you have a kind of nice kind of robot. And can you tell us such a kind of a, uh, communication, how to give a kind of command to everybody for such a killer robot or all the kind of V shape, such a kind of a bridging robot, whoever it is. Uh, it's a kind of actually. Maybe I'll answer the, the first in, one. Yeah, in the nature, right? There's also pheromone or uh, something like kind of many other kind of chemical gradient, whoever it is. So this is a fast question. Okay. Can I answer the first yes. question first? Okay, and then so I'll take the second one. How to make your engineering yeah. easy here? So first of all, the, the robots, uh, the kilobot robots communicate with each other using infrared, and they're actually uh, bouncing the infrared off of the, the physical surface. So the, their transmitter is pointed down, and it bounces off, and they talk to other robots. 
if we want to talk to the whole group, yes. we actually have an overhead controller that is flooding the system with infrared. So it can communicate one way with the whole swarm. And this is how we program the swarm or tell the swarm to start and stop. But an alternative would be that each robot can actually tell the other robots and even program the other robots. So you could do viral communication as well. But it's the same communication channel. Yeah. So we do have an overhead that is telling all of the robots the program yeah. and to start. Yeah. Right. And then the, the question about the pheromones, mm -hmm. pheromones and chemical gradients are, are and the morphogens are very similar concepts. But of course, we're not using chemicals. So we really are sending a message like my number is 10 and your number is nine and somebody's <laughs> number is eight. And so that's essentially how we're creating a fake pheromone or a fake chemical gradient. Yes. I hope that answer that is yeah. answering the right the, question. Is it scalable? For kind of for kilo robot, million robot. That's right. a kind of my question. Okay, second question. Yeah, Toshi, I'm gonna because the lack of time. I, I, I know we have second so many question. people. Who want. Important is uh, something like uh, you show such a phenotype of behavior. That uh, because I like to know such a genotype, such an intelligence. Because it's like you show so but because of mutation wise, there will be something wrong way. If you say go there, there are some of the always go the other way, like a mutation wise. So it's like a genotype wise. I'd like to so that intention that give a disturbance to give us some new behavior. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. And we have not looked at uh, having a separate genotype and phenotype and looking at mutations, but there are actually other groups that are doing this. And that's one of the things I really like about kilobots is that anyone can buy them and use them. So I hope that other people will try those kinds of ideas, but we have not tried them at all, for sure. Thank, thank you for your question. Thank you very much. Such a fantastic, uh, because I love it, such a work. <laughs> thank you very much. 40 years, thank you very much. <laughs> all right, thank you. Let's go to the middle. Thank you very much for a very amazing presentation. Uh, I think you have using uh, basically a visual information in your robot. But I think in nature, I think they can uh, use other environmental information such as uh, water flow yes. or the air flow or the vibration and so on. Yes. And what do you think about? I mean, uh, are you just using visual information because of its easier to do experiments or uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay but uh, yeah. no, it's, it's, I want I think, to know what do you think about that no I, I we're actually working very closely with biologists who are looking at vision versus for example the lateral line in fish where you're sensing flow and I think both both things are hard is in that the fish we know more about the vision than we do about what they're sensing with the lateral line. And then technologically, we're so much better at making cameras than we are at making pressure sensors. But in my group, we are starting to experiment with the lateral line as well. And there are a couple of groups that are doing that. I think it's just really hard to beat the cameras, which are giving you such a beautiful three-dimensional view. And I know that fish are actually getting a very good three-dimensional view from lateral lines, but we just cannot build that level of resolution yet. So I think that because I don't work on those kinds of sensors at the MEMS level, I think we need sort of more innovation there before it would be possible for me to use them. But I agree with you, fish are using many things, even olfactory, um, even uh, sonar, you know, depending on the size, you have many, many options underwater. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Let's go um, to the center here. Hi. Radhika. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, truly inspirational journey, Radhika. I'm very proud of you. Uh, the question is uh, about embodied intelligence. So embodied intelligence uh, depends on the embodied parameters, right? So there's huge variation across individuals, these parameters, like, you know, in your soft uh, uh, ratcheting type robot, the softness can change and then, you know, slight variations in the tendons and things like that. So we would expect it to be a very complex uh, or even diverge nonlinear dynamics, right? So in, in a collective, but they, they tend to be more like behaving like a tractor or like so they converge to some kind of a coherent behavior. How do you think? So what, 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 is, what are the guiding principles do you think in a collective 
that brings this diversity together to some kind of a meaningful behavior? No, that's a really interesting question. I mean, these systems are really hard to model, especially, I mean, the whole field of soft robotics is sort of struggling with the, the modeling aspect. But I think for me, the thing that I look for in mechanical intelligence is what are the embodied or mechanical intelligence that actually reduces variation. So, so if you think of the body being soft, we're actually using the body as a shock absorber. So it's really the compliance that we're using. Mm -hmm. And compliance is actually like absorbs variation, right, in a way. So, a lot of, I would say, you know, now that you're asking me, I'm thinking that lots of the systems that we have relied on in the embodied one are examples that reduce variation rather than create it. Mm -hmm. So they're basically absorbing the variation in the environment, they're absorbing the randomness in the environment, and sort of making it so that the behavior is simple in spite of it. Um, so I haven't actually used embodied intelligence in a way where we actually exploit the diversity. It's really been the opposite. It's been mm. using embodied intelligence to reduce the diversity right. Right. Um, that is coming into the system. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I think we'll take one more question to make sure that there's time to change for the technical sessions. So we'll go down here in the front. Thank you. Um, so, so uh, I think, you know, being inspired by nature is, is great, right? Evolution had billions of years to improve things. But it is a local search algorithm in the end, right? So do you think if we start from, you know, first principles, we can do better? Um, so certainly there are groups that are doing that. First of all, um, you can start from any principle, but you could also try and evolve these systems. Um, and so I'm, you know, the, I'm glad to have colleagues who are also looking at from first principles. And you're right that, you know, in my work, we're really looking at a specific group. But if you look at, for example, wolf packs, um, you're going to get a very different kind of collective behavior if you look at matriarchal herds of, of elephants. So I think if we look at these different collectives, we might be able to, you know, even in a biological sense, group them into answers that evolution has found and then try to see which ones are the best match. I would say my own sort of personal resonance is with these very large phenomena where at some point you almost think that they're particles in a swarm and that they could be almost inorganic. Um, and that that's the one that excites me because of the decentralization. But I think it's really only a very small sliver of biology because nature has evolved many other through local search. Um, so I think both looking at first principles and then secondly, also looking at other kinds of collectives, right? Human collectives, wolf packs, groups that are smaller um, and what kinds of roles and diversity and, and mechanisms are used in that, I think is really, really important. So this is definitely only one viewpoint. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for attending and the great questions. Uh, let's thank Dr. Nagpal one more time for her really inspiring talk.